Okay, welcome. We're going to continue in the tech deep dive track, talking a little bit about uh, high availability. Uh, there is a trigger warning for this presentation. If you have been traumatized by natural disaster, there is imagery in this presentation that might bring back unpleasant memories. So I've been doing this high availability update, or some form of talk about high availability, for three OpenStack summits in a row. Um, it's becoming sort of a fixture in the program. Uh, still, uh, we have very many newcomers. For, for how many of you is at the first OpenStack Summit? Plenty, right? So you will be asking yourself this question, and that's perfectly fine. If you're wondering who the heck is this guy up on stage, my name's Florian Haas. I am one of the founders, a principal consultant, and the CEO at Hostexo. We're a professional services startup. We do. Uh, the whole consultant, consulting nine yards from architecture to implementation to troubleshooting to performance tuning and training for uh, high availability distributed storage and OpenStack. Um, the first uh, URL up here on the slide is my sort of official corporate bio, if that's what you want to call it. And the second one, uh, that short link links to my Google Plus page. So um, if you want to participate in my ramblings about cooking or gardening or brewing ginger beer or kids and family, dogs, and occasionally open snack, by all means, please feel free to connect. Um, there's my email address. I don't, I'm one of those strange few holdouts that actually don't have a personal Twitter account, but there's one uh, for a company, and uh, we also happen to be exhibiting here, so if you want to talk to us, you can find us at Booth CA. Okay. I want to talk today about high availability in OpenStack, and when we talk about that, there's really four different things that we need to look into. And um, a, a few of these things have already been mentioned in the previous talk, and I presume in other uh, talks and sessions at the Design Summit and at the conference. Those four areas are the infrastructure layer, that is the stuff that sort of underpins an OpenStack cloud. There's two categories of that. Some of those are actually services that are part of OpenStack, and uh, some are services that OpenStack merely consumes but does not develop. Then we have the compute layer, OpenStack Nova. And in the compute layer, there's been a few interesting changes in the run-up to the Grizzly release and with the Grizzly release, and there's also going to be some interesting changes as we make our way into the Havana release. So there's interesting stuff coming there in the next few months. Then we have the OpenStack subproject, formerly known as Quantum, OpenStack Networking. Uh, there, there's been actually some fairly significant changes. Uh, OpenStack Networking kind of trailed behind in terms of its HA features in the Folsom release, and a lot of that has changed a great deal for Grizzly. And then finally, the subproject where I'm personally thinking there's been the greatest amount of change in terms of new features added and new functionality being incorporated into the subproject has been OpenStack storage, more specifically OpenStack block storage, the Cinder project. And I'm going to touch upon all of these and a few little odds and ends and extras that didn't quite fit into any of these categories. And I want to start with the infrastructure layer. Now, as far as the infrastructure layer is concerned, there's actually not that much that has changed from the Folsom to the Grizzly release. A lot of what we can do in terms of infrastructure high availability in Grizzly, we were already able to do in Folsom with much the same tools. The changes that, we've, that have occurred are not insignificant, but they're not exactly overwhelming. As far as the infrastructure layer is concerned, uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are some services that are part of OpenStack itself that are crucial to the infrastructure, such as, for example, the registry services, the API services, the Keystone authentication service, and so forth. And there are services that OpenStack merely consumes. So they're very, very critical to an OpenStack private cloud, to an OpenStack public cloud, an OpenStack hybrid cloud, an OpenStack cloud running inside OpenStack, all sorts of interesting things that people are doing, but they're not fundamentally part of the OpenStack project itself. OpenStack merely consumes them. And examples for that are the relational database that uh, we use for data persistence in an OpenStack cloud, 
Most people are using MySQL, some are using Postgres, some may be using other relational databases that are supported by SQL Alchemy, which is the ORM layer that pretty much all of the relevant OpenStack services use. Then we have AMQP, our message bus, and there we have several options. We can be using RabbitMQ, we can be using uh, Apache Cupid, uh, we can be using ZeroMQ. So those are the services uh, that we're talking about there. And there is a few extras as well, such as, for example, the Apache that runs and maintains the OpenStack dashboard and other things. So these two categories, but they're the kind of stuff that make an OpenStack cloud actually work, and basically keep things moving. And when we look at that, when we look at the infrastructure layer, the interesting thing from the HA perspective is we really have to consider five different types of nodes in an OpenStack cloud in terms of their HA capabilities and in terms of the things that we need to do to make them highly available. And um, this list of node types is not authoritative. It's just something that um, quite a few people actually agree on, um, but it's not something that is written down in any charter or bylaws or that sort of thing, but it's just a practical categorization. So for these five node types, and I want to go through them one by one and explain their, the specific HA considerations that we have to make for them, these five node types are the cloud controllers, the API nodes, network nodes, compute nodes, and storage controllers. Now what do we mean by all of these? So the cloud controller, it runs the services that underpin OpenStack. So it runs things like a relational database. It runs things like an AMQP messaging server. But then it also runs um, important uh, registry services and that sort of thing. As for the cloud controller, it very much depends on what the actual backend services are that we're using, whether we can make our high, our high availability essentially active passive, or whether we can use active active and get a certain amount of scale out. Generally speaking, when we consider all things, most people will be deploying their cloud controllers in active passive failover pairs. That's just the, the type that is most practical. For the IP, API nodes, that is vastly different, and I'll explain briefly why. A cloud controller, the stuff that lives on a cloud controller has persistent state. Now, this is particularly true for the database. So this is actually, this is using uh, short storage that is either shared or replicated that data goes into and that data needs to persist. And that is sort of local to the, to the individual hosts by default and we need to make sure that it isn't so we can actually achieve failover. The API services, however, by contrast, are fundamentally stateless locally. That is to say, if I have an API service instance, all that it does is it interacts with the MQP message bus for data that is essentially volatile or has a lifetime of about 30 seconds or less, and anything that needs to be persistent goes into the relational database. It does not go into any local file storage or anything of that nature. So as far as the API nodes are concerned, these API services we can, at least in theory, at least for most of them, have as many as we want, and then we'll scale out pretty much automatically what, highly available, what high availability management services help us do is things like making sure that we have, say for example, three instances of this specific API service running at all times in this cluster of seven nodes, just for the sake of argument, just pulling numbers out of thin air. And that is something that a, highly, a high availability management suite can help us do. The network nodes, these are very interesting. So the network nodes are the ones that if you are deploying a cloud that makes use of OpenStack networking, formerly Quantum, you have to have this node that takes care of routing between the tenant network, the management network, and the external network. So that's basically kind of like your upstream router, or you could have several of these in theory. And uh, it also does other things. Uh, a network node typically also runs the uh, quantum, sorry, the OpenStack networking DHCP agent, which provides IP addresses to virtual machines and tenant networks through DHCP. It, uh, and all of that, at least 
up until Folsom was essentially active passive only. And uh, there were a few things that were, that is actually not such a great thing to have that in an active passive configuration only. But I'm gonna get into the network node in more detail when I tackle networking. And then we have the compute nodes. Those are the ones that are actually our virtualization hypervisors. Those are the ones that run our services. Uh, I'm sorry, our, our guests, our, our, our virtual machine instances. And those are, of course, also pretty much naturally scale out. But if I want to enable a system where the cloud, in fact, takes care of high availability of these virtual machines, of these guests, that is, what I wanted to do is, if, an, if a machine, if a virtual machine runs on a particular host and that host goes down, I lose it for whatever reason, I then want to auto-recover it on another one. I can do that, but I need to do a little extra homework. And then finally, the storage controller. This is a very interesting one because it depends greatly on what kind of block storage backend we are using to determine what kind of HA we can do with it. So we can do, um, the, 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 the block storage server, the Cinder server, can be essentially just an API node that actually does no local storage locally, which would be the case, for example, if we're running, if we're running um, Cinder with an RBD backend, for example, a Ceph block device backend. Uh, or it could be highly stateful because it keeps a lot of data. And that specific data that needs to go into the volumes locally, which is, for example, the case in the default Cinder implementation with a local LVM and iSCSI backend. So for these five, like I said, the kind of bad news is we need to look at them separately. We need to look at these types separately when we, when we talk about HA. The good news is we can essentially use this. We can. We don't have to. But we can use the same high availability stack for all of these, just with different configurations. And that HA stack uh, is the pacemaker cluster stack. And pacemaker is essentially the default or state of the art high availability stack on the Linux platform. What pacemaker has going for it is it's been around for a really long time. And high availability, the management, the communications and high availability and the management of cluster resources is hard. It is not an easy problem. And what Pacemaker has done is basically over a period of, uh, well, the better part of a decade, has sort of banged out all of these corner cases that we've, that we, we've seen in the, in the project and fixed them, uh, which is why even though some people may consider it overkill or some people may hate its usability, makes it, in my own opinion, the best suited tool for the job to achieve high availability for infrastructure services. We have reference implementations for Pacemaker and uh, the underlying chorusing cluster messaging layer for all OpenStack infrastructure services. And we actually have uh, two people here in the room today that were very instrumental in building these reference uh, configuration. Emilien is up here. And Sebastian, where are you? Where did Sebastian go? You were, he was here a moment ago. Anyway, they'll be following me after this talk. So they'll be telling you more um, about that as well. So we have that, it's there. I will readily admit the documentation is still lacking. That will totally surprise you when it comes to OpenStack, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's there, it's doable, it works. Uh, I know I've personally deployed HA OpenStack private clouds in production with Pacemaker, and I know others have too. It's not rocket science, you can do it. It's perfectly possible. This is an example of a Pacemaker configuration, a schematic example of a Pacemaker configuration for a node type that requires the management of stateful data. That, for example, would be the case for a cloud controller. What, you, what you're doing is you're putting your data on some form of storage that is either shared, which is what you would do in a classic SAN setup, or we're, uh, we're replicating the data in some shape or form. And that replication can be one of several types. We can do block-based, we can do um, database replication, all sorts of things. And then you have a bunch of other OpenStack services that basically just talk to this cluster as if it were a single node. And the way that we do that is we just have these 
services, which are all IP-based, listen on a virtual IP address, and they fail over along with the rest. The IP address fails over along with the services. So when a service actually needs to talk to the cluster at and it, and it hits a, one node, one of the physical nodes, and that node then goes down, the service just reappears on the exact same IP address with the same data, and so to the consuming application, it looks essentially like a network hiccup, or as if the application was gone for a few moments, and that's it. Generally speaking, by and large, the other OpenStack services don't really notice interruptions like that. And this is an example for a stateful one. It's essentially the, uh, a stateless one. This is essentially the same configuration, except it's simpler because we don't have to worry about shared or replicated data. What we're making sure is uh, we've got a cluster management service running on a X number of nodes, and then we can create a configuration such that we are always keeping N instances of a, of a specific service alive. And we can do this in, in several ways. Um, okay, let's talk about compute. Compute is more interesting here because like I said, most of the stuff that we could do for infrastructure HA, we already could do in Folsom and there's not really that many changes in the Grizzly release. Now here, that's very, very different. We've actually had guest HA addressed in the Grizzly cycle. And here's one thing that we've always been able to do, except that many people didn't know about it. And uh, that's a little hack for Nova Compute. Um, what you can do is you can override the host name that Nova records in a database. And Nova has a flag that's called resume guest state on host boot. So what you can do is you have two nodes. Let's call them Alice and Bob for the sake of argument. And you uh, define a and uh, essentially a compute cluster. Let's call it compute one for the sake of argument. So you can fire up a machine here, a, a guest here, or, or dozens or hundreds, and uh, they will report into the Nova database as coming from host compute one as opposed to host Alice. And then if Alice goes down, we cut over to Bob, Nova comes back up, and it says, okay, well, I'm compute one. I now need to look into the database, what are the virtual machines, what are the guests that should be running on this node? And if we have this resume guest state on host boot flag set, what it will do is it will compare that, what it gets from the database, with what libvirt tells it, and then figure out, wait, I should be running 20 virtual machines here, and I'm not running any, so I'm gonna fire them up. And boom, there's my, there's my guests, and they're, they're still available. That's a bit of a hack because it has a few issues. Namely, it breaks live migration between those two hosts because I can't now say mi live migrate from Alice to Bob because Nova doesn't care. It's like, okay, that's compute one and here's nothing. So I can't live migrate from Alice to Bob that way. However, I can live migrate from, host, from compute one to compute two, another cluster that I have in the same system. And it has some safety issues with volumes that is to say, cinder volumes. However, those can be very easily mitigated by use of proper fencing, which is what you should do anyhow in any pacemaker cluster, or in any cluster for that matter, no matter what um, cluster management infrastructure it really uses. Host evacuation. This is a new one in, uh, in Grizzly. We have a syntax that now goes Nova evacuate, name of a virtual machine, and then the target host that we want to evacuate it to. So the use case here is a node has gone down, a physical node has gone down, and now I want to reassign those nodes to another host. Okay, and we have a variant of that, and that is the on-shared storage flag. The difference between those is the, for, the first one assumes that the, um, that the storage for the device is essentially ephemeral, so it just recreates the virtual machine on, the, on a different node from the same image with the same configuration and so forth. Phones have a silent switch. And, uh, and, it, and then it creates a new password for this thing and spits it out in the command line. If, if we do on shared storage, it just, what, I, what I've told Nova with that is all of its data is on shared storage or varlet nova instances is on shared storage. We don't need to recreate. We can just fire this thing back up. Now this sounds kind of great, but, and it made Grizzly, which is awesome. By the way, guess which zoo this Grizzly is from? San Diego. <laughs> 
Ah, huh? Huh? Ah. But the problem that I'm having with evacuate is I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Put yourself in the shoes of an emergency management official. And you were, uh, you were faced with impending natural disaster. When would you evacuate the city that you are responsible for? Would you do it when the storm is still 200 miles out to sea? Or would you do it after your city has been leveled? <laughs> Most people will prefer the former. No evacuate actually does the latter. You can't evacuate a host that's not down, which is a bit strange. Um, no, it will actually tell you, sorry, this host is not down if you, if you, if you type it, right? So this is not quite fully baked. I mean, it's great. It's, it's much better than the stuff that we had uh, in Folsom, which was basically get into the MySQL database and hack this column, which is kind of bad. Uh, but what we would, of course, like to see uh, later on is to be able to say, Nova evacuate this host. And then ideally, don't do it per guest per host, but make it just per host, as in tell Nova, I don't care where these machines go, but I need them recovered now. And at best, schedule them wherever the scheduler determines, and then fire them up there, right? So that's what I'd kind of like to see with that. But for now, it has these limitations. It is per guest. It is per host. It is only supported from a down host. And there is no automation that goes, OK, take everything that's on this host and move it somewhere else. You can't script that, of course. You could enumerate all the, hosts, all the guests that are currently running on a host, go through those, and then, uh, and then reassign them. So that's an interesting one. Um, and this is something that you probably guessed. We don't have support for it yet in the OpenStack dashboard. But that's actually relatively common. Whenever we get a new feature in Compute, it first makes the JSON APIs, and then it makes the CLI, and then it makes the dashboard. And since we have timed releases and we don't do things like we're going to drag out the release because we're waiting for a feature, that just didn't make Grizzly. And it's going to be in Havana. Oh, yeah. Here's another interesting one, VM ensembles. Um, this is an idea that I really like. And uh, the idea here is that you can uh, instruct a layer in Nova such that you can group guests in a resilient fashion. Consider this. Suppose you have an application that you want to deploy together. It's, an, it's a three-tier application. You've got six virtual machines in total two database backends, two middleware servers, and two front-end servers. And now you would like to be able to tell Nova, it would actually be kind of cool if you couldn't put the two database instances on the same physical node. Right? And ensembles will allow you to do that uh, and also add a bit of a convenient switch in there such that you can actually do a Nova boot for a full ensemble as opposed to just a single uh, host. Did that make Grizzly? Not quite. OK? It, it just barely did not make it. It was pretty close, but it didn't quite make it. But it's going to be in there in, in, in Havana. Um, it's currently uh, in review. At least that's what I checked yesterday. Uh, the, the, the Garrett change was, in, was a review in progress, and we can I guess, expect it for Havana. We have a workaround in Grizzly. It's not quite as elegant, but it still can be done. If I need to do what ensembles do for me, I can do that by using a filter scheduler in combination with the affinity filter or the different host filter, in which I can say, don't run these two guests on the same host. Networking. Generally speaking, we can use the same approach that we use for everything else for active-passive failover with Pacemaker. It works for, well, in Folsom, it's still called Quantum Server, so I can call it Quantum Server. Um, and it works for the L3 agent, and it works for the DHCP agent. Um, it had some limitations for the DHCP agent in Folsom, which I'm not going to get into in too much detail. You're likely not going to care. There were some minor limitations for it, and uh, we did not get very, very good scalability from the active-passive model, specifically for the L3 agent. Because the only thing that we could do with the L3 agent is essentially 
do it, uh, do an active passive failover, like from one node to another, that doesn't change the fact that pretty much all of the upstream network traffic still goes through the L3 agent. And so that means the only thing that you could do for the network node for scalability is scale it up, whereas all of the rest of OpenStack is all about scale out, which wasn't quite pretty in, in Folsom. It was, it was workable, but then again, there weren't that many people actually deploying OpenStack networking as it was released for, false, for Folsom for large clouds in production because it had other limitations as well. In Grizzly, we have this thing called Quantum Scheduler, and that is a patch that allows us to run multiple DHCP and multiple L3 agents, and it removes that scalability bottleneck. We can now scale out the L3 agent. And then there's other stuff, other things that were improved, such as, for example, we now finally have quantum security groups. We can have uh, per-tenant router networking. Um, that doesn't break the Nova Metadata API service because we have a quantum metadata API, pro uh, metadata proxy, and so forth. And that did make Grizzly, yay. So that's in there, and you can use it, and you can deploy it, and that's wonderful. And uh, now the really, really interesting part, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, in the last few minutes here, storage. I think it's fairly safe to say that whatever kind of storage you're using, if it's not supported by Cinder in the cloud that you're running, that's your own fault. You should upgrade. It's nothing short of jaw-dropping the, the, ad, the added functionality that we've got in the Cinder project for block storage. Uh, for the Folsom release, we had, uh, we essentially had the, the iSCSI backend with local LVM that supported two iSCSI servers, uh, IET and TGT, and uh, we had Ceph RBD, and, uh, and then there were a few drivers and you know, various shapes of, of usability and, and, and production quality. And now um, there, I think it's like 14 or 15 new drivers that we've got in Cinder. And Cinder now becomes essentially a pluggable API service that actually doesn't care about the actually storing data at all anymore. It hands all of that off to storage backends and it can use literally a boatload of enterprise storage backends on top of everything that it has previously supported. So this is a, a, just a, a very short excerpt of the list of new drivers that we've seen in Cinder for the Grizzly release. Uh, we now have a generic file backend, so you can actually put QCOW images that you then serve up as volumes for Cinder. That's, it's kind of strange that that didn't happen before because it's, it almost sounds trivial. That we can use for NFS. That we can also use for GlusterFS. Uh, there's a driver for HP left hand. There's a driver for 3PAR. There's new drivers for EMC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of storage backends that are, that are very popular among people building highly available clouds that you can just now plug into them and plug into Cinder and use them that way. Um, we, we still kind of have to use Pacemaker in this setup for the Cinder volume API node for the simple reason that it does something rather silly. Uh, I mean, and now it seems silly. It seemed fine when it was originally designed. And that is Cinder volume actually records in the MySQL database which was the host that made a volume available to the Nova cloud. And that's, that makes sense if that volume is actually physically stored on that host. It really doesn't if it lives back in a Ceph cluster or in GlusterFS or on a NetApp filer using NFS. And, uh, and so there's a, there's a little hack that we, need to, uh, that we need to implement there to make the Cinder volume service highly available. And interestingly, it's pretty much the same one that we implement for Nova Compute. We overwrite the host name and we put this thing under pacemaker management, have it listen on a virtual IP address. And then we can kill a Cinder volume node and it will happily continue to serve these volumes to 
um, existing uh, VMs and attachments never break, et cetera, et cetera. So that works very well. That worked well in, uh, in Folsom as well. Um, it just has gotten a lot easier now. And uh, there is a patch pending, well, no, it's, there is a bug filed against Havana uh, in which John Griffith basically says, um, well, actually, recording the host name in the database is kind of silly. Let's do away with that. And uh, I'm hoping that's a, a trivial fix and that's, um, that that's coming in, in time for Havana. And then there's a few random bits and pieces that changed or are changing. Uh, we, we, we're, we're getting uh, libvirt watchdog support in Nova and Glance. That is something that some um, HA cloud providers like to see. That enables you to define a guest that actually has a watchdog service running and uh, if, it in, if it encounters um, essentially the equivalent of uh, a non-maskable interrupt or a machine check exception or something like that, uh, it can remove, remove itself from the cluster if you want to do that. And that is also a flag that is being enabled in Glance. So in Glance, you can have images, Im image templates essentially where that is already enabled, which is also very useful. Heat. A lot of stuff related to high availability happens in, uh, in Heat these days. Heat is, of course, our, our, uh, our, our orchestration uh, layer in, uh, in OpenStack. Uh, Brian mentioned it in the keynote this morning as well. It's a very, very hot sub-project that uh, during, just, just before the Grizzly release uh, emerged out of incubation, became an integrated project, and uh, will see its first fully supported release with Havana. The same thing, by the way, is true for the Celometer metering and billing sub-project. So a lot of interesting stuff related to HA also going on in Heat. Um, RabbitMQ has, uh, not RabbitMQ, but the library that we use to connect to RabbitMQ, which is Kombu, has gained the ability to be configured with not a single Rabbit host, but a list of Rabbit hosts. And so if we're using uh, mirrored queues in RabbitMQ, we can just tell all of our services that, con that consume the AMQP bus that they should be talking to well, a single host and then can automatically do client-side failover to another host. So that's kind of cool. That happened in the, I think it was in the Kombu 250 release that sort of coincided with, um, that was like, I don't know, last, late last year, something like that, if I recall correctly. Uh, ZeroMQ, also very interesting. ZeroMQ completely does away with the idea of a brokered messaging layer, which is kind of nice. Both RabbitMQ and, and Cupid are brokered to, to a certain extent. ZeroMQ is completely peer-to-peer. ZeroMQ had interesting limitations with OpenStack networking in Folsom. Specifically, there were some interesting bugs or interesting problems appearing with the DHCP agent and ZeroMQ. We're going to see how that holds up in the Grizzly release. And another thing that's very interesting in the database space is that MySQL Galera is firming up. MySQL Galera is a, an extension to the MySQL database that implements WSREP, write set replication, which is finally a means of doing synchronous database replication in the MySQL database. Um, and that's being hardened. We, we see a lot of industry uptake for that. Also in the database, in database land that is completely unrelated to OpenStack. So that is also a very promising technology. We do not have yet in SQL Alchemy or in any of the uh, OpenStack database layers an equivalent to a combo with multiple rabbit hosts. So we can't use lists of MySQL connection strings or MySQL connection strings with lists instead of a single host name and then do automatic client-side failover. But maybe we'll get that. So that's also promising technology. And then I'm absolutely certain that there is some real, something really, really interesting that is really, really important for HA that I just admitted because I didn't have more time. There is super exciting stuff that is happening in RBD, uh, specifically when you use it in combination, when you, when you use RBD backends both for Glance and Cinder, and there's really, really interesting stuff also happening in the network layer and several other things. So, um, I just can't tell you more in the time that I, that I have here. 
but uh, what I can assure you is that we have a lot of stuff going on in the HA space in OpenStack, which is really a good thing because a year ago when I did the first one of this talk, uh, the first one of these talks, we were still discussing, do we actually need HA? Because a, lar a large, well, now you're laughing. But because at the time, a large number of, or a large portion of the OpenStack user ba base was essentially interested in, in building you know, massively scalable um, architectures that are essentially all comprised of cattle, in the pits and cattle analogy. And then it was about a year ago that uh, people started looking at OpenStack for something that would just completely reorganize their existing data center. And they don't have the luxury of having one application that they need to scale out to thousands of nodes but can rewrite from scratch if they need to. But instead, they have hundreds or thousands of applications that they need to run unchanged, and they need the cloud to provide um, high availability for, for them. And quite frankly, I don't care if AWS can't do it. I want OpenStack to be better than AWS in that regard, and not just in that regard. No doubt some of you are going to be asking for the slides. Uh, the bottom, at uh, the top URL is uh, just the slides themselves, and the bottom is the source on GitHub. This material is all CC by SA 2.0, so feel free to reuse it. Just credit your source and we'll be fine. I will not send you a horse head or anything of that nature. So please, by all means, feel free to use this and reuse it and take it to your, your user groups, your meetup groups, your companies, uh, wherever you would like to take it. And uh, for those of you who are now using their phones to photograph this and then maybe OCR it or any other geeky stuff that you want to do, why don't you use this? You know? That, that also just works. Okay? All right. How are we doing on time? Uh, I have... Three minutes for questions. Yes, back here. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did, I acoustically didn't, could you just come up a little bit? You're just talking a little quiet. Or run to the mic, that'd be awesome, then I don't need to repeat. That'd be great. Yeah, evacuate. Oh, okay. Yeah, could I use a could I use a monitoring tool in conjunction with evacuate? Yes, absolutely, of course. Um, it's just that, um, and what I would like to see, in fact, is something that's actually monitoring whether a, a, a node is is there or not. Um, and that is actually something we could build into into a, a pacemaker resource agent. And then if it's not, evacuate. That would be really kind of cool. Pacemaker. So, what, what about heat or cylinder as a monitoring tool to combine with? Evacuation? Well, cylinder can basically generate the event mm -hmm. that um, you uh, that a, that a node is down. Although for that, I would also rather use an an, um, an HA suite, but that's preference. Um, yeah, and then we could have something that reacts to that event, of course. Okay. Yes. I see. Okay. Here. Okay, so so yeah, so the comment was we should we should distinguish better between um, the the availability of essentially the cloud itself, so the infrastructure underpinning the cloud, and the availability of the services. Uh, no. no. Yes. It, so restarting a failed VM would be an HA service. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, yes. So, yes. So, to clarify, yeah, absolutely. So, to clarify, absolutely. AWS definitely has high availability of the infrastructure. Yeah. And we've got, we've essentially got that covered now. The part, and that's where we can match AWS, right? But the part where it would be interesting to actually get better is to add, you know, the, the support for, for automatic virtual machine recovery. Okay, if you want to call it high availability services, that's okay. 
we have two hard problems in computer science, caching, cache invalidation, and naming, <laughs> and off by one errors. <laughs> right? OK, I thank you very, I'm sorry, we, we're out of time for questions. Please feel free to grab me in the hallway outside, and I'm also going to be here all day tomorrow. You can also find me at booth C8, and uh, you can shoot me an email and connect with me on Google Plus and whatnot. I'll not be hard to find. I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.